rotational cosmology. And basically, when you look at Einstein's work, it doesn't make sense. It's as simple as that. You know, there's been thousands of books written trying to explain Einstein's theories, uh, and you've got to ask yourself why, if it's you know supposed to be at the core of our existence and um, and so simple. And the answer is basically that what Einstein did was to take something, take appearances, and say that they were real. It's like a bit like watching somebody disappearing in the distance on um, on a back of a train or something like that, and they appear to dwindle in size. And we know that as the train moves away from us, the sound from the uh, train whistle goes to a lower note. The tick of a clock of somebody wearing a watch on that um, train will slow. And yet we know that the person on the train doesn't experience shrinkage and he doesn't experience his watch running slow. But what Einstein said was that this is real. It's not. It's an, it's an appearance. And it's an appearance based on the speed of light. In other words, he said that the speed of light is the fastest speed that anything can travel at, that information can travel at. But if that's wrong, and I'm saying that it is, because as I said, gravity has to be able to operate between the sun and the earth near instantly. The sun, the earth is dragged towards the sun where it is right at this instant, not where it appears in the sky. Then you don't have this delay. There is no real difference in the ticking of the clocks of the person moving away from you. Uh, they're not the space that they're in isn't shrinking. Uh, these are just appearances. They're not real. But by Einstein's uh, postulates, these became real for science, and as a result, we've ended up with science fiction. At the quantum level, uh, Halton Arp, who I mentioned earlier, did the study on these quasars as they move away from their parent. Now, they move away uh, quite often along the axis. It's like having a Catherine wheel, and uh, from the center spindle, little objects are born, and they go away from their parent, away along that axis. He found that very close in, these objects had a certain redshift, and at a further distance out, they had another redshift. And wherever he went, these redshifts occurred in jumps, discrete jumps. There was never an in-between level. And this is, this is quantum mechanics applied at the galactic scale. So the idea that quantum uh, phenomena only occur at the subatomic is wrong. And this also shows that the so-called spooky things that happen at the subatomic level are due to the fact that the particles actually can communicate much faster than the speed of light. So all these things that are so-called spooky are not spooky at all. Once you get rid of Einstein's idea that the speed of light limits what can happen or the information that could be transferred from matter to matter over distances. So um, the incompatibilities arise because of this idea that one applies at the subatomic level and the other applies at the galactic level and never the two, two shall meet. I'm saying that yes, they do meet, but it's only because you've got your ideas wrong. Einstein's theories are wrong and quantum mechanics is based on a non-physical model. So you're somewhere in between with this. You're really in the... I'm, I'm saying the answer is in no man's land. Yeah, nobody, okay, well, yeah, nobody. okay, that's better. Much better. <laughs> I was a tournament tennis player for 13 years, so I do understand no man's land on the court, and it's really bad. <laughs> yes. It can be difficult. Why is plasma 99% of the universe? And explain what plasma is for us. <clears throat> yes, um, <laughs> it is a problem talking about plasma because there's blood plasma, of course, which yes. is uh, the fluid in uh, that flows around the body and in the, in the blood. Um, but the plasma that we're talking about is um, what happens when you pass electricity through a thin gas, for instance, and the energy of the electricity is enough to split the atoms apart so that you get bits of atoms which are positive and then the electrons that were stripped off, which are negative, all moving around separately. When you have that situation, electrical and magnetic fields have a big influence on what happens in that gas, and this is what happens in space. And uh, astronomers, when they finally got into space with uh, space probes, they discovered that most, almost all of the visible universe is in the form of plasma. Now, we don't experience plasma on Earth, and so most of the um, experimental work in science that was done up until about the 19th century uh, had no idea about plasma. And we still 
don't really un uh, have any idea on a day-to-day -day basis of what it can do. And it really is quite remarkable. It has almost lifelike qualities, and that may be one of the reasons why it was given the name plasma. Uh, if you apply, if you poke it, it responds by creating um, shields around itself. It'll form cells, it'll form sheets, it'll form filaments. You've all seen those little uh, plasma balls, novelty yeah. plasma balls with all those filaments writhing around inside. It looks like it's alive. That's the same kind of thing that goes on in space, only in slow motion, if you like. If we see it on the sun when it has its, its outbursts. All the outbursts are filamentary. And those filaments are actually the electric currents that are flowing through space. So um, if most of the universe is in this form of plasma, to ignore its characteristics when you pass electricity through it is a, a huge mistake. And it is a huge mistake uh, currently in astrophysics because astrophysicists are taught only to treat gas like a fluid, like a liquid. And that's wrong. The liquid doesn't form filaments, it doesn't form uh, sheaths around objects if you put an object inside it. It doesn't do any of these things. And yet these are what we see in space. So then you have the problem, it's like looking at a comet and saying that it's just gas and dust coming off from a, a little piece of rock. It's not at all. What we do see are jets, and those jets are the, the kinds of things that you see in electrical discharges, you see them on the sun. When you see this huge coma, which can be bigger than the sun, you've got to ask yourself the question, how on earth can a tiny piece of rock control a globe the size of the sun, of plasma? It can't, but electrical forces can. So uh, the difficulty we have at present is that astronomers look at things in deep space and they have these wonderful pictures that come back from the Hubble telescope and other telescopes, and they look at them and they have no idea what they're looking at. And so we get uh, really strained and um, impossible explanations, which are published in the papers and in the magazines. And we're fed, as I said, just science fiction. Let's talk a little bit about space-time. And I know that you don't like that term because it's totally <laughs> inaccurate and misleading. So yes. talk to us about space and time and share what issues you have with the way these words are used. I think one of the big problems that uh, <clears throat> we have in science at present is we've allowed mathematicians to um, take the running with the story. And mathematicians can be extremely clever uh, with their use of uh, mathematical logic, but it has nothing to do with uh, natural philosophy, which is the origins of um, science and in particular cosmology. The use of the word space and time together as if they have some connection is an example of the misuse of language uh, by uh, physicists or by mathematicians. Uh, space as a concept we all know about. Um, we can talk about uh, space enclosing a volume and you can define that volume by vectors, you know, radius and um, uh, you can also specify by three directions, you know, up, down, uh, the two sideways directions, length and width. But when you talk about time in the same breath in space-time, as one uh, scientist pointed out, point me in the direction of time. If you can't point in the direction <laughs> of time, then you're, you're talking nonsense. They're two different concepts. You know, time is the interval between events. And if the electric universe model is correct and that there is a universal clock ticking, then um, uh, you cannot fiddle with time. You can't uh, stretch it. You can't slow it down, speed it up. There is a universal uh, time as distinct from Einstein's one where, you know, clocks could be um, <laughs> had the Salvador Dali type clocks, you know, where you could bend them and warp them out of um, recognition. So time is a separate concept. To uh, ally it with space and call it a dimension is the misuse of the word dimension. Because a dimension is uh, something which has a direction. You know, when you hold a ruler, you've got to, you know, point it in the direction you want to measure and it has a length and um, of course uh, time doesn't have those so you can't call 
space-time, a four-dimensional 